Welcome to the Real Estate Finance Virtual Roundtable organized by DD Talks. Uh, we have a very uh, impressive panel today uh, from uh, across the real estate finance sector uh, who will talk to us about the various things that they are seeing in the market at the moment. Uh, We're coming to you on a, on a day of uh, the US election. Um, so there's much, uh, much to discuss outside of real estate finance, but we'll try to focus on the subject at hand. Um, and deal with the outcome of the election, uh, perhaps on the next talk. Um, what I'm proposing to do to begin with is to uh, move around the virtual room, um, inviting each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to give us a, a comment or two on uh, what's, uh, what they think are the pressing issues uh, facing them at the moment. And then we'll get into a number of uh, specific issues uh, which we'd like to cover during this talk. So with that in mind, I will hand over to uh, Gregor Bamert of Aviva Investors, please. Thank you, Jeffrey, and delighted to be joining the discussion today. Um, as mentioned, I, I'm at Aviva Investors. I look after our real estate debt business. It's a £9 billion uh, sort of asset management uh, business focused on the UK and European real estate debt. Um, you, you asked about things, things that we worry about, and I think the, clearly, we're in very uncertain times, and I think my principal worry from a real estate debt perspective is that market participants, whether that be landlords, whether that be tenants, whether that be lenders, make decisions in the very short term, which will have very negative long term repercussions. So I think it's kind of making sure that we, we kind of look through this and, and deal with things in a fashion which is long term secure. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to uh, Klaus Betzweiss from Lloyds Banking. Hey, Jeffrey. Uh, so my name is Klaus Betzweiss. I run the Global Investors and Listed team at uh, Lloyds Bank. Uh, Lloyds is a uh, kind of UK headquartered clearing bank, or one of the kind of the, the big four uh, lending institutions in the UK. Uh, commercial uh, uh, real estate lending is, is very much in our DNA. We've been active in the market uh, for, for, for many decades um, and we're probably one of the uh, one of the largest providers of um, kind of debt liquidity, um, uh, certainly from the uh, kind of senior uh, perspective um, to uh, UK um, investors, um, institutions, asset managers, uh, international private equity funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we're fairly active, and we continue to be fairly active. Uh, from from my perspective, the, the the probably the biggest worry is um, is the strength of occupied demand. So sort of going a bit to uh, uh, kind of Gregor's point. Um, uh, certainly, uh, in the past, uh, where we've uh, where we've seen uh, the biggest market dislocations is is situations where occupied demand is uh, is weak or fundamentally changes, uh, and uh, the impacts of uh, COVID nineteen uh, on uh, on quite large parts of the uh, the occupational market are likely to be quite material um, and also uncertain. Uh, so it's not it's not quite clear what uh what what is going to happen but it feels uh like generally generally speaking it feels like occupier demand is going to be a bit weaker for the next few years and that's probably going to have some uh, some repercussions um on the uh, on the real estate sector in the debt space thank you very much uh we're also joined today by Stuart hotston of natwest Stuart. hi thanks jeffrey uh so I, i'm Stuart hotston uh, i work uh, for natwest uh, I essentially lead our efforts in uh, structured solutions uh, and really what that means is in the CRE space is it's anything from repos to uh, nav lines to um, portfolio and warehouse type uh, trades as well as some direct lending. Uh, I think you asked about uh, what our concerns were. For me it's the uncertainty that's, that's the real issue here. Um, I think if you think about, if you think about uh, the level of uncertainty that we're living with I think six months ago we thought, uh, you know, in, in, we'll be past this, and there'll be a definite line beyond which we are on the other side. And right now, it doesn't it doesn't feel like that's anytime soon. And actually, every time I think about it, there's it's it's less and less solid that line. It becomes more and more blurred. And are we ever going to be properly free of this? Uh, possibly, but it's not going to be in the next six to eighteen months. And I think that I think that itself is a factor that's leading to, I think, uh, kind of an oncoming amount of distress. So that, that is, I find quite concerning right now. Thank you very much. Um, next on the panel is John Cole of Kane International. John. Thank you very much for having me uh, join the panel this afternoon. 
Uh, yes, John Cole, Training International, um, working with um, with the guys in uh, structured real estate finance, but uh, mainly what we do is uh, development uh, finance. Uh, have done since we began life uh, nearly seven years ago. Um, we manage uh, a book of around um, two billion at the moment, having peaked at around four. Uh, thankfully, we've had some payments over the last year or two. Um, you ask what concerns or worries, what worries me. Um, I try to look at the positive and, 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 and turn it around the other way. Clearly, you know, the, the guys of, of, of information have said that the, um, the uncertainty is the biggest issue, and I think that's right. Um, every day is different. Um, did we think we were going into lockdown too this coming Thursday? I guess it was probably inevitable, but will there be another one? And it's, it's, it's how you roll with the challenges and how you look at things as you move forward um, that I think is going to be the test of each and every one of us, not just professionally, but also personally. Thank you very much. And rounding out the panel, we have Hugh Fraser of M7. Hugh. Hi, Jeffrey. Uh, yes, my name's uh, Hugh Fraser from M7 Capital. We are part of the M7 Investment Group. Um, we're a full service debt platform that uh, provides origination and loan management services for, well, for M7 real estate and, and third party clients. And uh, we also have a small debt fund in the UK, which we are looking to, looking to, to grow uh, as rapidly as we possibly can. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of preoccupations that, that I currently have, um, I think I'd have to summarize it by saying is, you know, the, the overreaction uh, and fear um, that I think is, is coming from a lot of different parts of the market you know, people coming out and saying that off the face is, is dead and we should never lend on it again because you know, nobody's going to ever want to have rent an office space again. Um, and I think there's a little bit of that about retail, you know, especially on the retail warehousing side, things getting thrown into the same bucket. Retail is dead. It's not dead. It's just changing. Um, and I think there's, there, from, from my perspective, there seems to be a lot of overreaction in the market, which is very short term. Uh, in my opinion, and, and that, but, but obviously it has an impact on, on lenders in the market and what they're prepared to do. Understood. Thank you for that. Um, I think turning to uh, the various points we wanted to cover during the session, the first one, uh, particularly given the context of the uncertain environment that we're in, is how we are seeing borrowers react to this uh, state of affairs. Um, Gregor, could I ask you to uh, lead off and let us know what your experience has been. Sure, and I, I think actually one of the key things here is actually there's a lot of positive here, right? I think the vast majority of borrowers who we've spoken to, both in our book and, and more broadly, have handled the situation in a very proactive stance. They have taken uh, specific measures and they have been, uh, you know, very open uh, in fashion. So I think broadly speaking, there are probably three themes that go together. Um, and, and broadly speaking, they would have been in line with the timing in which they came into effect. The first of those, not surprisingly, is about physical safety. It was about people looking after their teams, looking after the physical buildings, making sure they were safe to occupy. Um, and that may mean reconfiguring office spaces. It may mean changing the way in which uh, individual units can be accessed. Uh, it can be cases of even on sort of high street retail, people constructing canopies across the um, the pavement so that people could, uh, you know, sort of queue outside as needed and, and, and make the environment more friendly. So people looking after that sort of physical element. The second piece is very quickly people being very proactive in discussing what actually was happening with their tenant lineup. You know, who are the tenants who actually are seeing very material, you know, and, and permanent changes to their business? which of those who are falling into seeing a bit more of a you know, short-term challenge and which ones were maybe slightly surprisingly actually doing very well, having adapted to their business and really adjusting their response to how those tenants are, are behaving and how those tenants are able to deal with the underlying uh, challenge. And the third part, and that's absolutely fundamental, is transparency. It's being clear with all of their stakeholders, whether it be lenders, whether it be investors, otherwise about 
what the challenges are, what the measures are being taken, and coming up with kind of collaborative so solutions to deal with this overall. So we, we've overall, we've seen a very positive response, uh, very active, very engaged. Um, clearly, there are exceptions to that. And, you know, some of those make their way into, in, into the, to the news and there is a more confrontational approach. And in some cases, that may, may need to be, be, be the right way. But overall, we've seen a, a very positive uh, response from, from the vast majority of borrowers. Well, that does sound promising. Um, can I ask the panelists whether they've had similar experiences in engaging with the, the borrowers that they're dealing with? I think on the whole, absolutely. Uh, our borrowers have been thoughtful. And uh, I think going into this, there was not a huge amount of leverage in the market. And that it didn't feel like the market was at a, at a high risk point. Uh, so I think people have been well prepared to be able to take some time. I think the approach of uh, certainly of, of the UK banks has been to um, has been to work with their clients. Uh, certainly, all the experience and and kind of uh, activity I've witnessed has, has been very much uh, kind of collegiate in that. But uh, you know, for their part, uh, my borrowers have, have certainly kind of stepped up to that and have done their homework and have kind of been very very uh, kind of considered in how they are approaching uh, um, kind of their situation. I think just to, yeah, uh, look, I'll, I'll, sorry, 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 here you go ahead. I was just going to say, I think, I think, you know, I think Gregor, um, Gregor, something had it spot on in terms of from a, from, from our perspective, as with my borrowing hat on, you know, it was all about communicating to our lenders how, um, how we were managing the M7 business in terms of the physicality of where people were when they weren't coming to the office, but they were able to work, uh, pretty much as they were before, but obviously with some challenges, but work effectively online. Um, and then I think, you know, it, it's all about being proactive and, and being transparent. So not just saying, well, I only have to report to you under the loan facility in, you know, on a quarterly basis. It's about, no, this is real time. It's all about, you know, cash collection, rent collection, um, and being fully transparent with, the, with, with your lenders as to where you were struggling um, where you were succeeding, uh, but just giving them the full, the full picture. And then sort of with my lenders hat on, I think we had that from most of our borrowers, but there are a couple where you had to, you had to sort of, you know, pull them to the table and say, look guys, this is, you know, this is not a time to be uh, not helpful. You need to be very open as to conversations you're having with your tenants, um, what rents you're not collecting, et cetera. So um, yeah, I think, you know, proactiveness and transparency are the key, the key words probably. Thank you, Klaus. I think you were going to come in with a comment. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, and I, I think like it's it's just echoing what everybody what everybody's I think said. Um, uh, my impression is the vast majority of lenders have been pretty reasonable uh, with borrowers when they've uh, when they've needed uh, things like covenant waivers um, as a result of, of of what's happened because they've taken the view that it's it's definitely not their fault. This is this is an exogenous event. Uh, that nobody could have predicted. Borrowers have been, in the main, very transparent with us and very helpful. And again, that sort of echoes very much what 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 he's been saying. So it's it's uh, it's it certainly felt like much more of a team effort between borrowers and lenders uh, this time than perhaps it was last time during the uh, during the credit crunch, uh, where it felt it all felt a little bit more adversarial um, and um, a bit less kind of you know solutionizing and a bit more. Uh, this is, you know, this is what the facility agreement says. So I expect you to, uh, I expect you to stick with it. And, and Klaus, do you think that's, do you think that's purely down to a better capital structure this time around with less leverage, or is it there are generally better partnerships between borrowers and lenders now? Look, I think, I think it's a combination of, I think it's a combination of both. Um, I think uh, last time, last time around, transactions were in the main less well capitalized, and therefore. Um, a little bit more speculative uh, from borrower's perspective. Uh, so, you know, if you had to you know, chuck the keys back, then, uh, you know, your overall, your overall loss with a, with a um, uh, limited recourse financing was, um, was potentially quite, 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 quite negligible. And indeed, you could make uh, some of that back by potentially, um, uh, you know, by hook or word, trying to retain, for example, the asset management, bidding the debt a discount, that kind of stuff. Um, whereas now that's uh, that's not that's not necessarily the case because people tend to have a lot more skin in the game. But I also think um, that um, uh, kind of the nature of uh, certainly in the senior debt market, the nature of that um, borrower lender interaction 
has changed a bit because it has been a bit more difficult to do stuff since the credit crunch. Liquidity has not been um, as easy to come by and uh, borrowers and lenders have adapted to that and realized that if they want to get if they want to get deals done, um, everybody's got to give a little bit more and be a little bit more kind of helpful and cooperative to each other uh, because that's the only way you're going to you're, 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 you're going to do it. You know, the days of people throwing around sort of, you know, 80, 85 percent LTV financing and please borrow from me. Um, those th- those haven't existed for over a decade and the market's probably uh, probably better for it. So this generally positive experience, in addition to being helped by the fact that the economics are such that it keeps the sponsor more interested than they might otherwise be in a much higher levered environment, um, seems to suggest that uh, selecting your borrower is also quite an important feature of the underwriting process to ensure that when you do get to these kind of situations, you do have a reasonable person on the other side of that table having that conversation. And I was wondering if people might want to just comment on that. I mean, I think we are advantaged in this particular session by uh, having representatives of the more professional end of the market in terms of how they make those types of assessment. But one of the things that I would ask people also to consider is what impact that has on what we were seeing perhaps in, in recent times prior to the pandemic, of a, a, an ask from borrowers to have more flexibility in terms of the portability of a loan and the importance to a lender of knowing who that sponsor is and not really being indifferent to you know, who might become their new sponsor uh, should the, the, the asset be sold. This is, this is what I call back to basics. Um, and, you know, I think a lot, most of us around on this, this panel have been at it for quite some years. Um, I've been interested in uh, statistics to add up how many years the experience in the, in the lending market we've got cumulatively. But it is very much back to, I don't think it's changed for a lot of people. It didn't change, hasn't changed for us at all. Um, it's the, 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 the importance of the partnership with your sponsor is paramount. If you have an alignment of interest, it, it, is a, it is very much a lender borrower partnership. And um, neither lenders and actually borrowers don't like surprises. Um, and it's how you manage through those situations um, in, in, as and when they arise, particularly circumstances as obviously as this. Not, no one, none of us around this, around this panel would have ever underwritten a pandemic. You can't, you don't. Um, but what you do is you manage the situation together when you when you face it. And I think that you know if you stick to those principles of um, that partnership approach, getting to know your asset, getting to know the validity of that as, of that asset, and fundamentally understanding its ability to generate a cash flow, which then would result in an exit for both parties, you, you want, you, you, you've got half a chance. But I don't think, and I agree with you guys, there's been no knee-jerk reaction that I've seen across the market as there was in the GFC. And um, this is a completely different set of circumstances. It's a health crisis which has created or will, has created and will continue to create an financial one. But together it's how we manage that through. And, at the moment, nobody can see a real end to it because there isn't one. But ultimately, I do think that, as Gregor said, there is some positivity around there. There is hope. There is still, um, there are still transactions being done. People are still looking to put capital and to invest for the longer term. Because you have to take the view, I would like to think, that there will be some level of normality that, that will return to each and every one of us. Because I don't think anybody can continue to live uh, in, in, in conditions that we currently face ourselves as much as we need to to protect uh, those that, uh, that are at risk and vulnerable. Perhaps on your point about uh, asks that were coming through before March, I think there had been some drift towards. Uh, certainly some asks for more flexibility, certainly around change of control. 
but I think that was limited to a certain part of the market. Uh, and, and, and you can probably count the number of clients that that might have been on one hand. Um, and uh, so there was a little bit of creep there, but it was only amongst some of the big PE houses, at least in my experience. Uh, and they weren't necessarily the types of deals that that um, that were going to pass our credit committee. So that, there was some there was some ask for that. And in certain limited circumstances, let's say they were heading into an IPO or something like that, then then you can build that into the structure, right? And you can anticipate it. But I think a generalized requirement to be able to sell on without without consent or or, or any or, or that sort of thing, that still for us is a no. You know, it remains the case that we we want to know our borrowers and we do want to lend to people who we we've kind of we know what we're getting, we know what they're doing, we know why they're there, and we know how they're going to get out. I and mean, if those things, if any of those things change, then we want to be at a, in a position where we can kind of talk that through. And having those sorts of requests to just being able to kind of sell on is, isn't anything that we were ever going to be able to get over, over the line. I, I think look, one of the other one of the other sort of fairly seismic changes over the last um, over the last uh, decade decade and a bit since the credit crunch is the. Um, uh, the, the the relative importance of uh, banks managing or lenders managing their reputational risk, um, KYC and compliance, um, because that 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 has been a uh, almost a bigger driver in some cases of um, of impairments and loss um, at lending institutions than anything they've done on the uh, the actual the actual lending side. Um, so again, that that just that just adds to the importance of understanding who your client is. And ensuring that um, who you start the deal with is, uh, to Stuart's point, the uh, the person who you are you finish the deal with um, through to eventual repayment. Um, uh, and if that's not going to be the case, then you want to have an ability to to influence that, not just because you want to make sure that they can manage the asset and they know what they're doing and they've demonstrated the right behaviors in the past, but you also want to make sure that you're dealing with counterparties which will reflect well on the institution on the lending institution that you work for and if you can't be comfortable with that then it doesn't it does not matter what the credit profile of the deal looks like it goes no further thank you that's very helpful and actually uh, quite a nice segue into our next topic in terms of what deals are getting financed in the market today and perhaps uh, come back to you klaus again just to say what kind of opportunities are you co are coming your way that you are willing to consider in the current market? Sure. So, so look, we've always tried to be um, we've always tried to be um, on the slightly more uh, potentially on the slightly more flexible end um, uh, of the uh, of the senior lending universe. Um, but maybe turning to sort of initially what what we see being financed uh, with relative ease, with a relatively high degree of liquidity, where we see the competition, uh, certainly um, in terms of the term sheets that we put out, um, anything that, that looks pretty prime um, with, uh, with strong tenants, long leases, where rent collection has been strong, um, either because the tenants um, themselves um, are uh, ones who, um, uh, you know, a moratorium or not choose to pay the rent, or indeed, where um, the nature of the asset means that it's 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 not something that can easily be disrupted um, through a kind of you know work from home, work remotely, buy things online type model because you physically need to be there in order uh, to be able to do your job. Um, that that seems to attract a decent amount of liquidity. Um, anything uh, with uh, anything in the PRS space seems to attract continue to attract liquidity, and that's both on the investment and the development side because of the, the, the perception that that is a relatively strong, robust, stable income stream. Um, uh, so those uh, you know, borrowers looking for that, those kinds of deals, um, I think uh, still have a good degree of choice. Um, uh, student housing seems to be relatively uh, liquid at the moment, um, certainly more than one, one, one would potentially expect because it's a pretty strong Operational performance um, demonstrated, uh, kind of in the uh, at the start of the uh, at the start of the academic year. Um, so all of that stuff seems to work pretty well. Where we definitely see borrowers uh, potentially struggling to um, to find uh, to find debt finance, or certainly competitively priced debt finance, uh, apart from sort of you know the the, the obvious sectors of, kind of you know retail or um, uh, potentially short let slash you know vacant secondary office you know, stuff like that, is anything which requires you know uh, quite a quite, quite a um, uh, complex business plan um, to get from kind of where it is to where it's going. 
Um, I think uh, I think that, you know, the lending community are generally being quite cautious around those uh, those kinds of opportunities um, where um, one uh, potentially needs to take a view on uh, the success of uh, of certain initiatives. And we certainly see those kinds of opportunities more probably going towards the uh, the alternative lenders, debt funds, et cetera, rather than necessarily kind of, you know, mainstream uh, mainstream banks, and insurance companies. That's interesting, sir. As you were taking us through that survey, I was forming the conclusion um, that the sort of preferred sectors at the moment are those less impacted by the uncertainty we were talking about earlier. But then you included student housing. And, you know, I wonder, or I would have thought that for some, at least, they would have uh, classed student housing as within the bucket of suffering from some uncertainty, you know, at least in the short term. Is, is that... Um, from your perspective, too short term, in the sense that you would look at it in a sort of a through cycle view of that kind of asset. Yes, look, I, I think that's correct, and I think look, there were there were certainly big question marks in kind of uh, you know uh, May, June, July around what is occupancy going to look like? Is everybody just going to stay at home because they're not going to get the proper university experience, um, and therefore, look, you you know you just you just defer it. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, the uh, kind of 2020, 2021 academic year looks looks pretty terrible. Um, but certainly what we've seen with the majority of uh, or the vast majority of the clients we finance is that performance has actually been strong, uh, if not in some cases record breaking in terms of the um, in terms of the occupational demand, uh, because effectively what certainly in the UK, what's what seems to have happened um, to uh, kind of uh, the in the mind of the average student is, uh, I don't want to spend uh, the next 12 months at home with my parents. Uh, I can't go traveling to Australia or get some sort of, you know, bar work or um, kind of take t take my year out. Um, so um, ultimately, uh, I want to I, I, I want to do something with my time. I want to get ahead. Um, and even if uh, even if the experience on campus isn't quite what it was uh, pre CV19, uh, that's better than uh, that's that's better than living at home and doing my lectures on video. Um, so, so, so that, that seems to have worked pretty well. Um, where we have seen uh, areas of weakness is um, some of the sort of the, the more prime end, um, uh, particularly in London, which is a, which is appealed to the very to, to what I call the very international students. So, sort of you know people coming from Asia, the USA, etc. Um, where uh, th those uh, those students seem to have been a little bit more reticent uh, to move, you know, a very long way away from home to have the UK. Uh, the UK um, kind of university experience, and that's that's where the weakness has been. But but in general, the sector seems to have performed pretty well, and certainly from a kind of a three cycle long term basis, um, kind of our thesis is that people will continue to invest in their education. Part of that education process is is the um, is the uh, is is the experience you get when you go to university, and therefore people will want to um, people will want to want to live in uh, in in student housing going forward, and it it feels therefore like a fairly robust. Uh, robust place to uh, to deploy that capital. Thank you. That's absolutely right, Jeffrey. And um, you know, the, the student um, operators themselves have adapted exceptionally well to the challenges that they face. And the quality of some of the accommodation that's out there and that is provided actually lends itself pretty well to um, a, a, a isolate self isolation um, with studios and various things. Klaus hit the nail on the head, you know, for, for many for many of the youngsters, it's, it's, it's a right of passage. And um, I, I personally can't see that changing. Um, I, I think the student sector is pretty resilient and will remain in demand for, for the foreseeable future. Thanks. John, could I just also follow that up with another question to you? Um, given your focus on development lending, does that permit you to have a time horizon into the future, which kind of allows you to see beyond our current situation and saying, well, you know, I, I don't need to worry about demand today. I need to worry about demand in 24 months when that project is going to be completed. And, you know, depending on where you, whether you're willing to take a view on how the uncertainty is going to unfold between now and then, but, you know, does that assist in your analysis saying, well, it's, you know, it's not a today question. It's a, at a point in the future question. I, I think, I think if, if I had a crystal ball 
um, over the years and, and, and looking at that crystal ball as to what your products will look like when it's actually completed. I probably wouldn't be sat on this panel now, Jeffrey. I'd be sipping a nice cocktail on some Caribbean beach or something. But it's By yourself. A... Huh? By yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a fair, it's a fair question. Um, I think you, you, you always have to, to look at the here and now. Um, but you, you're fundamentally looking at a project and building in to every project areas that are unforeseen, whether that be through time and or through um, budget. You're always erring on that side of caution with every, every development deal that you do. Um, as I said, nobody could have underwritten a pandemic. So do we look at what's going to happen in two or three years as having this all blown over? I'm not sure it will have completely blown over. There will be impact there. But you'd like to think, and I think every one of us on the panel today, amongst all the audience that, that will look at this, will hopefully take the view that things should look different in two, three, four years, in some way, shape or form. It might be... Um, they might there might be in uh, COVID-21, for example. We don't know. But I think fundamentally, you have to look at the quality of who it is you're, you're, lend, you're, you're partnering with, as I said before. That's really paramount. It's then the long-term uh, sustainability and predictability of that asset and the sector that it's in. Um, and hopefully then, it will create demand and people will either want to buy it want to rent it which will generate that cash flow it is it, it is to a large degree when we look at our own portfolio we have no um we, we have no developments that are due to complete imminently so when we look at our book for example it's that it's a minimum of, of late into next year and well beyond that so to a large degree you can stress and we have stressed as I'm sure everybody on the panel has, their, their book to the nth degree. And you can stress it and you can underwrite it a million different ways. But ultimately, it comes down to those principles of, of, of the market at the point in time of delivery. And we're senior lenders, and it's our job to, to get a fair balance between where we sit in that capital stack, working in partnership with the equity that and it's a different risk profile and we get paid differently for it. And maybe just to add to that, I mean, although we, we don't do a lot of development lending, our, our heritage, as you, as, as you know, is, is very much long term lending. So while we offer a range of products, our underwriting, we still think about that long term. And, you know, several deals we've written this year are 10, 12, 15 years long. So if you're writing that kind of business in any market conditions, you're going to assume you're going throughout at least one major downturn. And therefore, you have to factor that in. And so the questions of, is the person you're facing going to be the sort of person you want to face in a downturn? Are the assets sufficiently resilient? You know, what are the plans to deal with, you know, more challenging situations? That's the sort of stuff, you know, you kind of need to look at day one coming into this. And yes, absolutely. The scenario is, you know, pandemic wasn't one of our main stress scenarios, but to an extent, we had some pretty significant stresses on occupier demand and on value, and we weren't really prescriptive as what was going to be the driver of those. I think the interest, one of the other interesting things, Jeffrey, as well, is depend obviously on the sector. You know, there, there's there's likely, as I think Klaus mentioned earlier, there's likely to be some changes in the underlying uh, industry attached to those properties. For example, the office. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the, the retail uh, sector, whether that be retail warehousing or, or high street, you know, the move to turnover rents is, is probably inevitable um, across a number of those. And you, you have to take that into account when you're looking at the transactions and where they deliver. Um, but you know, looking around and, and seeing occupier demand, it's... It hasn't fallen off the edge of a cliff. It might be postponed, but I don't think you've got any of the large occupiers, not that I've seen anyway, or heard that that, are, that were in the market and are still in the market looking for large amounts of, of space. They haven't suddenly turned around and said, we don't want any. They might have downsized slightly to accommodate current 
situations. But these guys are also looking five, ten years into the future and growth as well. And I think it's the natural thing to do. And, and you know, we're, we're all working from home. and have been for many months. Um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to build and grow businesses um, without that collaborative effect, without that ability to uh, meet people, because we all do deals and we all transact, we're all people, people. Um, you know, those that know me, I have a saying, it's the whites of the eyes, but it's very true. Um, and it, 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 it's important. I think it's important for the growth of, of business. It's important for the development of people. And, you know, for the, for the health, both physically and mentally, of, of each and every one of us. So I agree with what Hugh said when he, when he started with his introduction. I think the depth of the office is, is, is very much overdone. And, you know, interestingly, I was speaking to, to uh, some advisors in Ireland a few weeks ago, whereas, as you know, Google have a huge presence. And they surveyed... Um, at the Google staff at the beginning of the pandemic in March on the basis that they asked them if this, who, who would want to work home, uh, at home permanently. Um, and I think their staff came back around 20, 25 percent, something like that. They then redid the survey three months later in the summer, June, July time, and that number halved. And that's Google, which is a collab, which is a, 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 an ideas-based uh, Google. Um, but I thought it was just an interesting, to, an interesting fact that I'd heard a few weeks ago, and it certainly rings true with me. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that, John. And I, weirdly, I think one of the one of the things I think that may come out of this pandemic is you know, the Landlord and Tenant Act gets uh, put in the drawer where it probably belongs in the past. I mean, it's based on feudalism, um, and it, it just you know how can anyone running a business today really look at look down their crystal ball and say, well, I'm going to sign a 15 year lease? How do I know that this space is going to be relevant for my company in 15 years, given the way everything's changing? So, I think uh, both investors and and lenders are going to have to come get their head around the fact that actually, uh, I think one of the things this pandemic will do with people, especially in office space, is say, well. Why, 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 why do I need to sign a 10-year lease? You know, I should have more flexibility. I, I'm happy to pay for flexibility. And I think that, I think we will see lease terms change uh, going forward. Well, in any circumstance where there's significant change to industry, you're going to end up having those who are better or less well suited to accommodating that kind of change. Um, and one of the things that we are, I'll use the expression, blessed with in the real estate space uh, is a very wide variety and a continually increasing variety of lenders um, who are able to offer terms. Um, you know, and obviously they, their structures are different, their uh, areas of interest are different, their risk appetites are different. Um, Stuart, can I ask you to comment, please, you know, uh, from your perspective uh, in this current environment and in anticipating of the changes that are afoot, you know, is this a, a better or worse uh, type of situation for different types of lenders? Right? I think certainly the conversation we've had so far is those on this panel have had a reasonably uh, consistent experience, uh, but you know, is that likely to be uh, the experience of those in the broader lending community? Yeah, I think. So there's the situation as it is now, and then I think there's the situation as it's evolved since March. I think liquidity has been um, variable across that across the the last six to eight months, very much so. Uh, and I think uh, you know clearly there was very little liquidity in Q2, very little liquidity at all, for, especially for new client uh, new clients and new trades. Uh, there was a lot of forbearance and there was a lot of reupping uh, kind of trades that already existed. But for new for new deals, I think there was very little liquidity coming into Q3. I think people people certainly on uh, it, from my experience felt that there was a bit more space, a bit more um, uh, that our heads had cleared, that we'd managed to get our heads, uh, managed to get on top of uh, our 
what was going to be distressed regardless of how this turns out and what was probably going to be robust enough to survive one way or another through that medium to long-term pickup. And so from that, I think I think certainly lenders who are not relying on distrib distributing their risk were able to start kind of coming back to market with a limited appetite saying, look, for the right trades, we can do stuff. I think coming into Q3, there was a brief kind of couple of weeks of sunshine where I think everybody thought, right, we can kind of get back to a normal Q3 and we can try and do lending again like we would normally do in a Q3, even if, if even if we're pickup is delayed, et cetera, et cetera. I think then we kind of started to hit second wave across Europe and 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 kind of in the UK and certainly in the US. And I think that's 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 again changed, at least from my perspective, how people are feeling about liquidity. I think I come back to something I said just a moment ago, I think for lenders who aren't having to distribute, there remains uh, kind of a nice pocket of liquidity that uh, that can be focused on their core clients and on and on really good solid trades that are coming through the door. But I think my experience of those lenders is that we are not necessarily looking to add new clients at this point. We are looking to provide really serious support for our existing clients, even if that means that they're bringing in new deals they're, they are the ones that we are going to be working with first, partly because we've already established how they behave during a downturn and doing distress, et cetera, et cetera. But also because um, kind of going in, going into uh, new deals with new clients at this point, just uh, it's just hard to get past uh, a credit line that is worrying about the, the immediate near term distress that we might be facing. Um, I think for client uh, for lenders that are having to distribute debt, I think we certainly have seen them be in the market less than they were before. I'm not one, so I can't really speak for them, but that is my, that, that's kind of my view of what's going on there. So I don't think this is good for any particular type of lender right now. I think kind of coming into Q1 next year, when we start probably start to see some distress flowing into the system properly as governments start to pull back the, uh, the kind of the fiscal support they've put through and the stimulus. Um, I think at that point, there'll be other lenders who have been sat on the sidelines. I've certainly had conversations with some of them saying, who have been saying, we are waiting for those distressed loans to come through so that we can support the DPOs and lend to the people who are, who are kind of managing their way through that. They at the moment are sitting on dry powder and are waiting to do stuff. So there are people who are waiting for the right moment. So it's not necessarily a brilliant time for them right now, but they don't see it as a bad time. They just see it as then it's not quite the right moment for them to be deploying their capital. Um, yeah, so I think I, I think that's probably the most relevant points that I have to to kind of say. Thank you very much. I, I mean, from 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 my perspective as a borrower, I think it's really really difficult to uh, to actually track exactly what happens to liquidity, especially during the last the last six to nine months. I think if I use the analogy of a Formula One race. Um, yeah, midway through the race, lockdown restrictions announced. I'd say 50% of the cars drove immediately back to pit lane, straight into their garage, whacked the garage door down, uh, and just didn't respond to anyone knocking on their door. The other half probably drove back into pit lane, put on some really fat tires, got back out on the track and drove as slowly as they possibly could. And and hence, uh, you know, from, from my perspective, it felt like Half the liquidity was gone, you know, whilst people might be saying, oh, we're still open, they weren't. And the other half, you know, probably half of that half were, were also just driving around looking at stuff but not really doing anything. Um, you know, in, in July, we went out, and I know it was retail warehousing, but we went out, I went out to 36 lenders and got two offers on two separate retail warehousing deals. So I was one from one from 35, if you put it that way, I had two different lenders end up giving me terms, but I have never ever in the 11 years of M7's history gone out, had to go out to so many different lenders uh, who, okay, it's retail warehousing. So I know the retail is an evil word, but notwithstanding that, yeah, this is even to lenders who were, were pre-COVID actively lending on last mile logistics off a 5% initial yield, weren't prepared to give me terms on a retail warehouse, which has a longer wall, has, 8% initial yield, a much more coverage, much better real estate. Um, but because it's tagged retail, it's it's a no, it's, it's you know, I think one of the things that happens in these crises is it's really difficult to actually understand who who is 
you know, even if they have capital, whether they just know we're sharp, but obviously they don't announce that to people, um, and who is you know, generally still looking and closing deals. And with that, Hugh, number, you, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Hugh, can you potentially, as, 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 a, as a buyer, as a borrower, can you use that to your advantage in terms of being able to get better terms from the vendor? Because you can use that as a justification to say, look, I'm sorry, I've got to get you, I've got to buy it at price X rather than price Y because I made an assumption no. around my financing and that market simply isn't there at the moment. Or is it just a net loss to you because you can't, oh, you can't do that and you to, still have to transact? We, we, we've ended up paying, uh, we're paying 4% to 55% LTV loan, um, interest only. Uh, on the on the bigger facility, so the 150 million facility, we, we took out with a, with a PE house, and on the smaller one, we're doing with an insurer, 50 percent, 50 percent interest only. At uh, they ended up doing that at 325. So it was more, you know, both those terms were accretive to what we were buying. Uh, so you know, so they still you know are very accretive to the performance of the equity, hence um, keen to take them. I, it doesn't. It's not. It doesn't sort of translate to a conversation where you say, "Oh, I mispriced my or my the cost of my debt just went up by 100 bips, therefore the price is coming down." I think that conversation with vendors is more driven by uh, rent collection, who's paying, who's current, who's not, than 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 the cost of the debt. I, I don't follow Formula One particularly closely, so I can't kind of give a give a, a similar analogy to, to to Hugh's experience. But going back to to, 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 to Stuart's point, I think absolutely agree that early on, you know, post lockdown, a few deals that sort of stumbled across the line that were mostly mostly ready and stuff like that. And there was very little liquidity. But I do think that there certainly was a bit more selective return to liquidity um, in terms of transactions during the course of Q3. I think, you know, quite a few transactions uh, we looked at did, did get completed overall. Um, and we saw actually a situ situations where whilst um, the absolutely we saw that trend of people saying I'm only looking after existing customers and to some extent I you know, have sympathy for that. It also meant that the opportunity to, you know, to kind of do new deals with new new clients was absolutely there for the right ones clearly on a, on a selective basis in terms of who those counterparts and who those which, which sectors those are in at overall. Um, we also saw an interesting sort of side effect, which I appreciate isn't what you asked about, Jeffrey, but one of the things that as people thought more about the kind of future proofing their assets and, you know, longer term, you started to see a bigger focus on actually what are people going to do to those buildings over the longer term and bringing a lot of sort of ESG type themes into the, under, into the whole business plan and financing structure as, as well. So I think that's kind of if you have to think more carefully about what your assets are going to look like and whether they're fit for purpose over the longer term, that's a very natural step for people to take. I think it's, it's probably a discussion for another day, but I think that has been one of the untold stories of the year is that we certainly have seen that theme as well, is that there, there's been a really big opportunity for us to say to clients, what are you doing about ESG? But most of them are on the front foot and coming to the market, say, coming to us saying, this is our plans, this is what we're thinking about. So that that has been going on in the background with quite a strong kind of undercurrent. But because of everything else, you know, that it's not something that we, you know, has been talked about a huge amount, I don't think. Yeah, no, look, we, we've definitely we've definitely seen that as well. ESG is 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 racing up the agenda uh, for for anybody um, who manages or raises capital. Uh, it's certainly uh, pretty key on uh, on our agenda. We've uh, to the, to the extent that we've recently uh, partnered um, with a uh, with a with a sort of uh, ESG sustainable tech company and launched an app. Uh, where effectively our clients are able to um, put in the details of the of the assets they own or the assets they're uh, proposing to acquire. And what it does is it takes publicly available data and it spits out um, a number of suggestions around um, uh, what kind of investments they could make into those properties um, in order to um, improve their environmental uh, sustainability credentials. It costs those up for them again, roughly, and it sort of kind of demonstrates a kind of uh, return on investment as well as a return on um, kind of uh, limiting uh, overall CO two emissions. And it's been hugely popular. Um, uh, you know, we've we we we've got we've got massive interest from our clients, and that goes 
right the way from you know some of the you know some of the biggest names in the business that manage uh, tens of billions of, um, of pounds dollars euros capital all the way through to sort of our mid markets offering um where um uh you know historically you you wouldn't have had much traction with that conversation uh but all of a sudden they're they're very interested so uh it's definitely a uh kind of a, a a theme that um that's gaining traction and uh, you know we expect to see more and more and more of that um going forward thank you um gregor just to say i think from a formula one perspective um if you align yourself as being the mercedes of real estate lenders I think you'll you'll be going in the right direction. So uh, beyond beyond that, you probably don't need to get yourself involved. Um, and it's very interesting this conversation about ESG because we see it on the legal front as well um, in terms of the Loan Markets Association and the Commercial Real Estate Finance Council. Um, you know, all of the sort of supporting organisations are trying to um, position themselves to facilitate um, the uh, evolution of this aspect of, of the, the finance marketplace. Um, I think it, it's very much in its infancy in terms of how this will operate, how it will create incentives for, um, for better assets uh, in the real estate space. Um, and, and possibly more so uh, coming to you, John, in the development space than um, it might with standing assets in terms of what can be done and whether that's a feature um, of, of the deals that you're seeing. Uh, one of the um, points you made earlier is that even in this time of uncertainty, it's about coming back to the, the, the basic principles of how you approach an underwriting. Uh, but I'm wondering whether there are other features that you are uh, thinking about in the context of new deals that might be appropriate in order to try and you know, mitigate risk in this environment, uh, whether that has to do with um, looking at it from an ESG perspective or just generally economically. Um, does it require a bit of a rethink or can we proceed as we have been? I, I think that um, developers are always looking to innovate and even more so now with um, the COVID situation on how they develop their space, how flexible it is, um, how innovative it is. I think um, the the ESG credentials have been there for, for quite some time. They're taken very seriously. Um, and actually to end users, it's very, very important when they're making decisions about where they would like to locate. Um, you know, the carbon footprint that a building um, produces is very important to, to a number of those occupiers. And actually in certain cases can be the deciding factor as to whether they take that space or whether they don't. Developers are taking it very seriously, and technology is improving in, in, by, by the by the month. So we see it a lot on the schemes that we're involved in, um, and that's all the way through the supply chain. Um, it's it's the, not just the, the finished product, but it's also how how it's how it's got there, and the raw materials and all the trades that are with, that are involved in producing it. Um, Looking at, you asked the question about underwriting slightly differently. Um, I think that you, you can you can underwrite for you can underwrite and underwrite and underwrite. And actually, in a lot of ways, when you're faced with situations like we're faced at the moment, it's actually it becomes a little bit simpler. Not binary. That's too simple. But it becomes. A, a situation as to, as the panelists have, have pointed out, there have been certain finances that are happy to, to sit and wait. Um, it's easier sometimes not to take that risk and to sit and to wait to see what pans out. Um, we take the view that we, we've remained open throughout the, 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 the pandemic. Um, we've looked at a number of opportunities and there's no doubt that there's capital in the marketplace and interest rate environment is very low. Um, I don't think that necessarily is a, in, in days gone by, you would underwrite, underwrite interest rate risk quite significantly from, you know, from where you started on a development deal to where you ended up, you would build in quite a significant buffer for interest rate rise. That I think is, is not gone, but it's certainly 
um, a low risk in, in my view. I don't think interest rates are going anywhere for the foreseeable future. Um, alternative use is an interesting one. That's, that's something that we do look at. We've always looked at, but we look at quite closely now. Um, just to give that, that extra angle um, to change an asset if required once, once you get there. Um, but it's really, as I said, it, it is very much the simple back to basics approach of who it is, what it is, where it is, and does it have an ability to generate some level of predictable cash flow, sale or lease. And from those fundamental principles, you can generally underwrite the risk to get a feeling. Uh, it, it's a conviction at the end of the day as well. None of us always get it right. You can make lending a science if you wish, and you can build as many models as you want to, and they're really critically important. But at the same time, it also comes down to that, that conviction. It's about experience. It's about um, collaboration with others. And ultimately, it's a blend of all those things, and you put them in the mixing pot, and hopefully you come out with a nice baked cake or whatever it is you're doing at the end of it. But, you know, the, 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 the age-old the age saying is that, I think as a lender, we'd all agree that you only really know whether you've done a good deal when your money comes back. And until then, it's, it's a case of working with your clients through the good times and, as we see now, the not-so-good times to ensure that together you, you, you get through it. Sometimes you've got to be a bit tougher to get to get to the right end result, but generally that's when it that's when it matters, and that's an experience thing. Um, and it, it's it's there's no there's no real rhyme or reason to it. I think is is the answer to the question, Jeffrey. Apologies, it's I can't give you a formula on the screen um, because there isn't one. Everybody does things differently, has different risk tolerances different requirements for their capital, wherever they may sit. Um, and it's how you assess that risk and how you execute upon it to hopefully deliver what you, you, you set out to do. And at some stage, as, as planned, the money comes back with a little bit of interest on top. Thank you. And that, that seems to me to be a good uh, business model to try and get your money back with a bit of interest on top. I think that's fair. I think sometimes we'll find that borrowers um, choose to not appreciate that lending actually is a low margin business. And it is very much about getting your money back with a bit of a margin on top um, and not uh, being a, a risk taker in the same way that the, the equity might be. Um, but I'm going to come back, Hugh, to you. You commented in passing on the need to revisit the leasing environment. Uh, particularly in the context of flexibility um, and coming into shorter terms of leases and getting used to that and getting used to underwriting that. Uh, I, I would add to that something that I'm seeing from my experience is also, um, and taking on board John's point about seeing, seeing your clients, customers through the good and the bad, landlords being asked to also take a view on um, the financial performance of their tenants and to uh, adjust their leasing arrangements so that uh, that performance is also taken into account. So not only do we have the potential of a, um, a lesser commitment in time to that asset, but we also have more variability in the potential um, revenue stream coming through to the landlord from that asset. Um, or perhaps if the government carries on as, as they have been, no revenue at all, um, depending on the circumstances. Uh, I just wondered if you uh, had any comment you would like to make on that wider uh, revisiting of the leasing relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in some ways, if I go back to the, the roots of, of, of M7, you know, which started in the multi light industrial sector before it was renamed Urban Logistics and priced much, much, much sharper than it is. It, you know, I think our business was always, we were always managing sort of two and a half to three year waltz. We're always managing SMEs, um, some, some who are performing strongly, some who are performing not, not so strongly. And so I guess a part of our sort of hands-on active asset management 
has always had a little bit of what's happening in the pandemic now, which is, okay, this guy's not paying his rent because he's, he's told me his business is struggling. Do I stop his lease and get him out and pay vacant rates and have some void, void downtime? Or do I actually believe what he's telling me and you know, back him to turn his business around and give him a six month rent holiday or at least a, you know, a rent reduction? And so there's kind of always been that, that element to it. And, and that's kind of been no different during the pandemic. I think we've seen both good behavior and bad behavior from, from, from our tenants. Some, some of our retail warehouses actually here in the Netherlands, just not you know, international brands like Yisk, just not paying their rent. And you, you know, Remco who runs our business here had to take a video that he'd shot on a Saturday afternoon where he'd gone past their shop and their car park was absolutely jam packed. They were, it was, their shop was, was, was full. So whilst there was a, a so-called lockdown in the Netherlands, these guys were doing a roaring trade and you were kind of like, come on, please don't, don't misbehave. You need to pay your rent. Now that's, the, that's one side of it, which is then just you know, managing the, the relationship. The other side of it is, you know, if you've had a gym tenant, a cinema tenant, a restaurant who has physically been closed by, physically been closed by the government, um, the government has put in an interim law where we can't, uh, we can't evict them from their space. Um, so we're still, you know, on those sort of situations, we're sitting on our, sitting on our hands. Thank, thankfully, we don't have too many of those situations. But I think, you know, we, we have to wait to see when the, the lockdown, the pandemic is, is more in the rearview mirror to then determine how, how do we manage those situations. But I think a lot of them, I think the landlord is just going to have to take the, the hit of, of lost rent because, um, you know, it's not, you know, I believe, and, and I think a lot of judges will believe that it's not just for somebody to pay a full rent if they've been legally forced to shut by the government. So I think that pain will ultimately land with, 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 with the landlord. Thank and you. If, if we have to, I hope the number's not big enough, but if you have to in some situations, then you, you, you I, I can't see you sharing that pain per se with your lender, because as John pointed out, you know, they want their money back with some interest on top. But maybe you have lenders that help you by amending a scheduled amortization profile, or what have you, to to help manage your cash situation. But but I think yeah, that's that's as far as we'll go. I don't think it's ever going to uh, certainly not in our in our area. I think if you're a borrower that owns a a hotel group or a restaurant chain, then it's a different story. Um, but I think on sort of a multi-use portfolio like the ones we manage, I don't see them having any impact on our on any of our lenders. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've come to the end of our time. I think uh, on this particular topic, I understand that DD Talks has a session plan for NPLs for next month. So you know, it may be that uh, one leads on to on to the next. Soon, Hopefully not. Soon. Next next quarter. Um, in the meantime, uh, ordinarily this would be the point of the session where I thank our panelists and give the audience an opportunity to show their appreciation. Uh, with some applause, I think, given that we are doing this virtually and on a recorded basis, we'll have to wait and see whether anybody ticks the like uh, uh, thumbs up box uh, when they watch this on YouTube. Uh, but from my perspective, please, can I just give my thanks to everybody for taking their time out of their the day this afternoon to uh, contribute their thoughts on where we are in real estate finance uh, at the moment. Um, and uh, hopefully the, continue, the situation will, if not, uh, become less uncertain, at least uh, become more benign so that we can uh, do more transactions looking, uh, looking into the future and uh, at some point look back on this and well maybe revisit this when we can do it live and in person rather than simply on a video screen.